Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing special guest Dan Holloway. Based in Oxford, Dan is news editor for the Alliance of Independent Authors. For his day job, he's been an administrator at the University of Oxford since 2005. Uh, he's founder and CEO of Rogan Terabang, the second spin-out from Oxford University's Humanities Division. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Agnes Kaz Shoes. Uh, I'll put a link in the uh, description <laughs> and LinkedIn and LinkedIn, and you can check out his website uh, uh, on LinkedIn at Dan Holloway. And find hundreds of his posts on the Ally website or Alliance of Independent Publishers at selfpublishingadvice.org slash author slash Dan Holloway. In this uh, annual book publishing industry roundup episode, I'm really excited to talk to Dan about some of the some of the biggest and most interesting developments in the year uh, in the book publishing world. Uh, so thank you, Dan, very much for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I have fond memories of, of being here. Yeah, uh, so for anyone watching or listening, uh, Dan was here six years ago. Uh, it's a reminder of the sort of timelines of these of, of this industry and things like that, and how much things can change. But uh, we were just talking before this interview, sort of planning our conversation, and it's just, I mean, you know, there's six years of time, but like 2023 felt like six years of time in some ways. And I mean, there was the whole pandemic in between and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, in the interest of just sort of covering everything, so just to sort of set the stage, um, at the, to begin with, we're going to talk about sort of developments in technology. So this will be about Spotify and the Spotification and of streaming earnings and things like that. Uh, and we'll be talking about a shift towards um, print on demand by an actual conventional publisher and what that might mean for self-published authors and getting in bookstores and things like that. Uh, we'll talk about AI, uh, which is a huge topic, obviously. And we'll talk about accessibility. Um, in the second part of the interview, we're going to talk about, uh, we broadly categorize this as regulation. So this will be the Penguin Random House Simon & Schuster uh, attempted acquisition by PRH that was blocked by the Department of Justice in the U.S. under their antitrust division or uh, sort of prescriptions. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, book bans and Elon Musk just to get a little bit of controversy and uh, virality in there, <laughs> which I'm sure he'd be he'd be all into. Um, uh, and we will sort of there, there's another thing about regulation about the recent very recent uh, EU AI Act, uh, which kind of spans the sort of technology and regulation space. And we'll talk about the UK online sa online safety bill. And then the last part of the interview, we're just going to sort of focus in on indie publishing, and we're going to talk about audiobooks, we're going to talk about graphic novels, and then we're going to lead for the very end, um, the really one, one what might be the most uh, interesting topic here, actually, which is the uh, Alliance of Independent Publishers or Allies Indie Author Income Survey that came out this year, which is actually kind of a big deal to those of us who are in this world. So let's go, uh, Dan. Uh, let's start <laughs> by talking about Spotify and Spotification. So what do you mean by, by Spotification of sort of books? Uh, earnings. Well, I, I oh, that's a. I guess I mean several things. So first of all, is the fact that the consumer side, right, that the people are used to getting their content by streaming, um, and subscription is becoming it ever more. In, it's how people imagine that they will consume their content. They won't. There seems to be this move towards sort of not owning things, but having the ability to stream unlimited content um so that's that's the consumer side the the author side i think we we all watched what happened in the music industry um i remember there was a there used to be memes that went round where you'd have sort of comparative sized circles i don't know if you remember this feels like sort of very mid 2010s um which showed this is how much you get per listen if you sell your a CD back in the days. So it's back in the days when there were CDs. You get this much, and there'd be a circle like that. If you if you sell it a single online, you get this much, and there'd be a little circle. And then it would go down and down and down. And then there'd be like a microscope view of of if you have a thousand listens on Spotify, you will get this much, and there'd be something the size of a pin. Um, and I think so. We we watched it happen in the music industry, and I think there is now this sense that is this what's going to happen in the in the audio book yeah um and in general the 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 literary space especially as i know there are there were a lot of concerns when the big publishers signed up with spotify um writers were concerned that they they weren't consulted and there was a real lack of transparency about the terms that were being agreed to on their behalf yeah just for for anyone listening who might not be familiar with kind of the ins and outs of the business model but you you could sort of paint it paint a very clear picture by saying Imagine if uh, streaming took off in the way that the streaming companies want it to, 
and nobody bought anything to sort of possess anymore, like download and have. Yeah. Um, we were talking about digital things. Um, and in, imagine everybody in the world who could uh, had, a, let's say, a Spotify account. They all were paying 15 bucks a month for their Spotify account. You've got a fixed amount of money from whatever comes out of that to distribute to all of the people, the content creators who've, and publishers who've put content on there. And But as time passes, I mean, we all hear about, you know, there's 300 million new videos on YouTube every minute. The, the sort of uh, pie of money is not changing, but the number yeah. of things for people to consume is growing. And if, it, if uh, assuming that they, they get their ideal world, everything, that, all they're doing, they're, they stop working, they stop doing anything in their lives, and they're just listening to or watching <laughs> streaming content all time, uh, then the, the proportion for per view or watch or interaction just goes, uh, that you would get as a content creator, just goes down and down and down and down. So there's something kind of inherently flawed from an earnings perspective one might say for this just business model full stop it sort of it feels as well as though this comes at the same time i know you in your very well structured introduction you said we were going to come onto this later um but every all of these things intersect um it ties in with the the growth of ai generated audiobook narration and the big model that all the people who want to get into this, the platforms who want to get into this, what they say, they talk about the fact that 90, was it 94% of ebooks don't have an audio version. Um, so that's the model they use. This is why you should get into it. But as far as I can see, that's not necessarily, that's not going to be matched by the same growth in subscribers. So what you're doing by essentially, you're upping the number of books available by an order of magnitude. So you're, you're timesing it by 10 if all of these were to become audiobooks. But the number of subscri subscribers is remaining essentially the same, so the pot of money is remaining essentially the same. So it, it sounds great. Look, there's this massive untapped market. Um, you could fill it with, with, with your books that currently aren't earning what they can earn, but all you're doing is you're, you're stretching the same, the same field even thinner. So you'll be putting more work in to, to earn possibly less out of it. It's, sort of, it's like the long tail, which everyone got very excited about and authors got very excited about and um, artists, wrote, music artists got very excited about. And then everyone realized the only people that benefited were the platforms, not the creators. Yeah, my uh, my sort of, you know, um, maybe maybe semi-professional kind of opinion about these streaming things. I, I wrote an article on um, TechCrunch years ago about when Oyster uh collapsed very predictably if you just looked at the business model and the way it worked um i think i would say that like probably the future for streaming when people kind of internalize these facts and you know spotify just laid up laid off a bunch of people so who knows what that portends about their own stretching of revenue and things like that but it streaming might will be great for discoverability no. uh but not for monetization that might be actually the kind of ultimate future of streaming when people kind of finally give up on the idea of, of making money off of it and realize it's not for making, make your money from something else or from works yeah. that aren't on, on streaming instead of trying to, I mean, you know, cross your fingers and hope something happens. It feels, talking about going back to the long tail, it feels as though we, we've almost come full circle on this sort of Kevin Kelly idea, the thousand true fans that that went really out of fashion. Um, it was there back in the early days of, of being an indie back in the sort of the, the noughties. Um, then it went really out of fashion, and now it sort of feels like it's it's earning its place again. This idea that you build a really loyal following and you sell them high value, high quality things, either that they can't find anywhere on these streaming services, special editions or luxury editions, or by touring, gigging, merching. It's it's going back to the sort of model that that music has made for itself. Yeah, definitely the um, uh, the the sort of like actual interaction with you, whether it's you on physically on a stage in the same room with somebody, uh, whether you're Taylor Swift or you're you know in a bookstore, uh, you know giving giving a book launch or something like that. Uh, but that that I, I yeah, that's sort of like again, sort of AI is probably going to be working its way into everything we talk about. Um, but my again, sort of like only semi tutored view is that actually what's going to happen with AI is that it's just going to make the importance of actual personal interaction. Uh, with with sort of fans or supporters or people who are genuinely interested in you, 
uh, it's just going to make that interaction more and more important. And whether it's like liking a tweet, you know, uh, replying to one, um, uh, you know, well, or, or, or a, a blue sky or a hoot or whatever it is, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that, that you're on, but like actually that kind of interaction, it's not just, it's not just sort of indie authors or self-published authors. It's like, you know, uh, you know, big rock stars and stuff like that. Like everyone's finding that it's this, take some time to do this interaction with people. They love it. You'll build a fan forever and things like that. And hoping that some, like some company is going to kind of come up with a sort of business model based on lumping your content in with millions of other pieces of content is just probably not, uh, gonna, gonna sustain itself maybe. Mm. Um, I think, I mean, going, going back to the, to what you said about the layoffs, I think what the problem that Spotify had is they couldn't quite work out what kind of company they were as well. Cause they, they've thrown an awful lot of money at big deals and getting, getting big names on board. And that, that seems to be what's, what's caused them all their problems is, is hundreds of millions of dollars on Joe Rogan and Prince Harry and some of them, it's, it's very, it's very hit and miss, but at that level of investment, you can't afford too many misses. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's an area kind of out of my, <laughs> definitely out of my expertise, but you know, it is, I've, I've, I've been in sort of, you know, business situations where people get really wide eyed about star power. Mm and things like that. And it's sort of, it is, it is interesting to think about like, well, are you in the business of like hits, uh, just like any kind of, um, uh, conventional news broad or sorry, t television broadcaster or even book publisher might've been. So if you're in the interest of like big celebrities and big hits, that's one thing. But if you're in the business of like millions of things for people to stream, that's actually something completely different. Yeah. Uh, and I take your point about how, like, do they, do they, have they had trouble figuring out who they are. Right. I think the the other model that you can go down um is what what Wattpad does really well. Um and you see it with other platforms like Twitch is they they don't invest money in massive people who are already stars, they nurture their own. So Wattpad's created this sort of end to end thing where you can go from literally posting your first ever sentence on the site as as a total newbie writer. You can you can publish a paragraph a week and it, it will take you from that all the way to having a Hollywood movie all within the Wattpad sort of umbrella mm -hmm. um, and not investing, they're only investing in people that they have grown on their own site and investing to develop that talent through other media rather than bringing people in to try and draw them to their platform. I think that's a really, they understand how the relationship emerges and evolves and readers and writers grow together yeah and definitely the um the all the sort of inherent potential of running a self-publishing platform where people are coming to you with all kinds of different content and ideas all the time on their own yeah uh, and then sort of watching what happens and what you can how you can help them and and the more you can help them the more you help your own platform which is why yeah. you know we're in the business we are too you know the sort of virtuous circle of like you know we make money if, if we can help authors succeed and the more they succeed, the more other authors can succeed and things like that, which is, you know, just, uh, um, yeah, great. And like, you know, I'd also like, but of course, if you get to the size of Wattpad, I forget that someone bought them for like hundreds of millions of dollars, but like, uh, that having, being able to do acquisitions to get that pipeline going where like, ultimately, yeah, like you could, you really could start with a sentence from your fan fiction idea and end up with a, with a Hollywood contract at some point. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, just moving on, because we've got so much to talk about. Um, uh, so in a very recent, uh, one of your very recent uh, Ally podcasts, you talked about how a publisher, Mensch, I believe, uh, has switched to print-on-demand production for its books. Yeah. I was wondering if you could so, talk a little bit about that, yeah. So yeah, this is, it's, um, I believe it's Richard Charkin's publisher, who's been a very vocal advocate of increased sustainability in publishing. Um, this has been... It's been one of the themes for the last couple of years is that publishing is finally admitting it's got a problem with sustainability and with, with environmental impact as though sort of almost as though it's news when it can't be news that, that there, there are all these issues, whether it's the fact that they print things halfway around the world and then ship them tens of thousands of miles to their customers. Um, they have massive print runs, um, 
they cut down forests even if, even FSC paper still comes from somewhere. Um, the paper production in itself, the, the amount of water that's used in producing paper is is sort of eye-watering. And then on top of all that, there's the issue of returns, um, which is the, the big thing that causes most of the publishing industry's waste and environmental impact. Um, yeah, so I think it really... would probably be really, really, I think there are probably a lot of people who'd be really surprised to hear that about refunds. I was wondering if you could just maybe dive into that a little bit. Why, why is, what, what, why are there so many refunds in the first the, place? The, 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 the returns issue. Oh, returns, from, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so by and large bookstores, they basically take things on consignment. That, that, that's essentially the model. They, they will take a bunch of your books on the agreement that if they don't sell them, you take them back and then you deal with them as a publisher. Um, and the way you deal with them is by pulping them and turning them into something else. Um, and in that process, you repeat all the travel miles, all the the waste that comes from the recycling process. All, oh, here go my light. I, I warned you the lights are going to go. I'll be back in a moment. <laughs> that's okay. For any, no, that's okay. Just for anyone watching, uh, Dan warned me in advance that... Uh, this, he's in a room where these lights are going to be happening, so there'll be these odd sort of brief inter, uh, yeah. interruptions. And I just just on a personal note, I'm traveling currently too, so there may be the odd cat or bump in the background. So, so it's it's, it's, it's either get up every every twenty minutes or constantly wave my arms around like that and hope it the sound. It'll be okay. um, so so yeah. And this this goes back to what we were saying about Spotify paying out a lot of money for big names because obviously publishers. They're essentially in a gambling business. They they have these big initial print runs and they gamble on making a bunch of money out of at least one of the books. Most of them don't make money, as we know. Most books um, sell fewer than a couple of thousand copies. Um, and that means that most of the books that are printed go back to the publisher. They they lie on a bookstore's shelves for a few weeks. They, then, they, they go back to the warehouse, they're pulped, and they're turned into something else. And it's... It's an incredibly wasteful process um, in many, many ways. Um, and the the upshot of that is that as indies, we've always sort of had a bit of an advantage when it comes to sustainability because we, we publish print on demand. So the, the advantage of the print on demand are you don't have returns, obviously, because you're, you're ordering on a, an as sold. So it's a... It's a just-in-time system to, to think about it from a sort of an, an, another industry's perspective. We're about the only industry that doesn't really have just-in-time delivery, um, apart from print-on-demand. Um, it's also print-on-demand books tend to be printed where your customer is rather than where your business is. So if I'm a UK publisher, if I sell a book to someone in Australia, then it will be um, I think Ingram now has a factory in Australia for print on demand. Um, it will be printed in Australia and shipped a couple of hundred miles rather than several thousand miles. Um, yeah, just 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 customer. yeah, just to jump jump in there. So for anyone who's listening or watching who's like not not doesn't uh, really hasn't heard of this before, uh, sometimes when you go onto a website and order a book, you click a couple buttons, you put in your your credit card information and stuff like that. Sometimes what happens is. The, the internal system from whatever platform you bought the book from goes and finds the book in a warehouse somewhere and then gets someone or a robot to go get it and, and you know, put it in a package and send it to you. But another thing that can happen is when you click that button, it sends a message to the closest print-on-demand facility and it produces the book there. Uh, based And so there was no book when you, or when you ordered it. Mm -hmm. The book was created after you ordered it and then you get it. And so the idea, this is like the complete opposite of like, I'm just going to print a hundred thousand copies of a book. I'm going to send it out to put on shelves and then I'm going to get back all the unsold ones. Um, uh, you know, just a completely different model. Uh, and it's very interesting to hear that like a sort of conventional publisher is moving to this. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the problem with it from, is one of the reasons why as indie authors, we tend not, we tend not to rely on print books by and large for our, for our income is that it's made us really uncompetitive because this is this is a really expensive way to do it because obviously having things printed a mass run the other side of the world and then shipped um to us and distributed out it's it's a much cheaper way of doing it than than printing one at a time um so bookstores by and large have not liked to stock um 
print-on-demand books, and we've not liked to put our books into bookstores because they the, the store wants to take a decent cut of the cover price. And if they want to take a decent cut of the cover price, and the print cost is already much larger per unit than it would be for a traditionally printed book, then that leaves us either with, with nothing or having to sell our books at a price that's just going to be uncompetitive. And that's what's really interesting about publishers moving into this space is this idea that it's sort of moving books from being a commodity to a premium item. Um, and it's it's shifting. The, I think, as has happened with food, that the whole environmental conversation has shifted a lot of conversations towards seeing things that were seen as almost throwaway items into something that is more luxury based um, and something that has a naturally higher price point. Um, and that's going to make our our self-published books more competitive. Um, the more publishers who do this and the more that conversation happens, the more it's going to mean that we're, we are able to, to offer things at the same price as, as everyone else is offering. Um, but the, the cheaper versions will still be there through libraries and eBooks. Yeah, that's and that comes back to what we were saying about about making money from a few fans again. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really interesting. I, I had not put that together. That that's exactly that. The mechanism there was with if the big publishers go to print on demand, their per unit cost goes up, which presumably mm -hmm. means the cost of the book in your bookstore goes up. Uh, but but that means that the sort of per unit cost for the self published author and for the conventional author are the same. Uh, and that means that um, uh, if you're essentially, and again, I love the sort of comparison to kind of like locally sourced, you expect to pay more for a locally sourced food item. And yeah. you might, the, the convention might change that like, well, that book, I mean, it's going to cost more than it would have in the past, but it came from down the street instead of, mm -hmm. you know, across the ocean. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, though, no, that's, that's, that's a really, that's a really excellent explanation. I, I wonder if we might even see it, see, talking about going retro with a return to the idea of the espresso machines. I don't know if you remember, they yes. never really took off. Yeah. They were going to be the next big thing where, where each yeah. bookshop would have its own printing, mm -hmm. printing press in store. You could mm -hmm. type in the title of the book you wanted and it would, it would print it then and there. Yeah, no, that would be, that would be a really interesting development. And as you say, really good for, um, sustainability. Uh, I had next in my list AI, but you know, I think probably the next thing, the next thing, uh, technology topic to talk about after sustainability might be accessibility, and then we'll go do go into the big kind of AI thing. Yeah. <laughs> so you wanted to talk about accessibility. Uh, what's what's? Uh... Yeah, I I was just wanted to talk about accessibility for for authors because it's something that often gets overlooked, um, and it's something I've been starting to work on this year. Um, so we, we're very used to thinking of accessibility as a thing that we do for readers, how to make our books accessible. Um, so print books, we're used to thinking about large print formats. Um, we're used to thinking about making our eBooks compliant um, with, with WCAG guidelines. So the web content accessibility guidelines, I'm always used to calling it just book agates. I think that's what it stands for. We're used to making things compliant with that so that they can be used by by screen readers um, and all sorts of assistive technology. Um, we're less used to thinking about how the processing, the process of publishing and self-publishing can be made accessible for authors. Um, because there are there are lots of ways in which um a lot of, a, a lot of the steps involved are they rely on things that are difficult for lots of groups of people, um, in particular minoritized or disabled groups of authors. Um, it's one thing that we we will look at that's really interesting that comes out of the Ally Income Author Survey, actually, um, is how self-publishing can help a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily, who would struggle with the mainline publishing process. But Things like interacting with agents, the fact that agents will only ever interact either over a lunch or by telephone, that makes it really difficult. Um, having to produce submission packs to a certain format makes it really hard for people who who have, I don't know, issues around dexterity, executive functioning, things that make it hard for them to produce things in a, in a cookie cutter 
format. Um, so I, I'm really interested in the ways that technology and inclusive design can be used to make the publishing process more accessible for authors. Um, yeah, that's 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 a really really great point to bring up that I think can like you know very easily be lost on people who don't 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 are, have disabilities and face those challenges. That for example, something like you know when I hear that like in order to sort of like submit a book to a publisher for a bidding process through an agent, you as the author have to write a forty page business plan. Now, uh, often uh, I just think how annoying. That's incredibly like just just annoying, but like for some people they can't they they just can't do it in the format that's presented to them. Uh, yeah. It's just not possible. Yeah. So so am I allowed to plug that I have an open source? Definitely. Um, I, I I have an open source platform. Um, so I'm the director of a community interest company. We started up this year, um, called What We Need Support, which is it's an open source platform for support need creating standards of support needs for different kinds of vulnerability or disability um, with the aim of providing industry standards to different sectors. So we, we started with a, um, with financial services and I'm, I'm really looking to move into publishing. So I'll be at London Book Fair talking about that next year and various other places. Um, I really would lo love people to get involved and tell us what they find difficult about the publishing process. And how can people get so, in touch with you about that? Um, they can get in touch through the website, which I'm hoping by saying that by the the magic of me sending you an email that will appear in your um in the text that goes with it. Awesome, awesome. Um, okay, but I, I think that really ties us in nicely to AI because AI is one of the ways, and I think agents would hold their hands up in horror at the thought that you did your submission or you got ChatGPT to write your business plan, but. This is something that people are clearly going to do, and it leads us nicely into a conversation about AI. I think. Yeah, let's let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go there. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, maybe let's start with something. So, um, let's set the stage. Let's let's imagine someone's uh, been been uh, stranded on a desert island for the last year, and they're they're into the world of books and self publishing and and publishing and everything like that. And they come back and they're like, "Whoa, what's what's with all this AI stuff?" Um, I guess we have to start. So, so one of the things that's been really interesting, and this is something that I have noticed has brought out both the best and the worst in the creative community, is how this this wave that we've seen approaching us from the horizon, how it has reached us in stages. So, it started with voice narration um, about two years ago. Um, voice narration started to get really good when it was generated by AI to the extent that you had companies like SpeechKey and DeepZen um, came to book fairs and they had these these tricks where they would they would play AI voices and real voices at you and I'd get you to tell the difference and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference and they and you'd say wow that's narration has come a long way since since the days of things that sounded really techy and sounded like a computer speaking. Um, and when that happened, voice artists said, hang on a minute, we're not so sure about this because we have, and I know, I know you covered this when you were talking with Jane last year. So that that's sort of an indication that it was one of the first things, um, the first areas. Um, we're not so sure about this. Um, and it's almost like the the sort of the famous Niemöller first they came for speech is that, that a lot of people, other people in the creative industry said, oh, well, that's that's a real shame, but it's not ever going to replace. And then they would say another sphere of the arts. Um, so for example, um, I think that the, the next one was the image. Um, that's fine, but it'll never replace paint it, painters and cover designers. And then you had Mid Journey and Dali and programs like that that got really, really good at producing art. And then earlier this year, you had them winning art prizes. And then cover artists got really upset because people could go onto these platforms and they could type something in and say, I'd like a cover in the style of Blah, who was a best-selling cover artist. Um, and again, authors would say, well, this is this is a real shame. I can see the business benefit to, to us because like AI voice narration, this has all sorts of advantages for people who can't afford to work with a human artist. Um, it's reducing our cost, but but it's never going to replace an author. 
and then sure enough, and it just comes in waves like that until it just happened with words and first it came for poetry and then it came for short stories and then it came for novels and, and now you've got you've got um ai generated fiction that is pretty much indistinguishable from human generated fiction um and all of a sudden the authors are going everyone's got to protect us having started over there with the the, the voice artists and it's like oh well that's we're, we're very sorry for you but it's not going to happen and it, it feels like that that's what i would refer to as as sort of the, the worst of the creative community it brought out a lot of, of divide there's a lot of lack of solidarity with people who didn't think it was going to come for them um while it was coming for the people over there um and now all of a sudden it has and i think everyone now realizes that there is no one who isn't going to be affected by this um and now they want everyone to have solidarity with them and that, that that's kind of feels it, it's kind of sucky <laughs> it's not a good attitude and and um maybe now is the time to for everyone to get together but i think there are some bridges that need building in that in that process um with our creative partners yeah that's a that's a really excellent description and way of way of sort of telling the story of how it happened but also in a kind of you know uh, appropriately loaded way uh, when we're talking specifically to people who are in this sort of writing creative community who, as you say, may not may have been kind of not caring so much. And that we're not 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 everybody, but like you know, it, there were you know yeah. a lot. There was, as you say, not necessarily a lot of solidarity from the beginning. Um, I guess there's one one. There's a couple of specific things I'd like to ask you about. The first is I know that so one of the big controversies uh, with, with these large language models, which is partly what we're talking about mm -hmm. when we're talking about AI specifically with respect to writing, um, is that they were trained, uh, yeah. on, uh, you know, boatloads of, of data, um, including some books, uh, yeah. that, you know, a couple hundred that would spe specifically open AI. I think it was 300,000 books or a hundred thousand books yeah. or something like that. And there was a list that you can find and stuff like that. And, um, there are a lot of authors who sort of saw that, oh, my books were included in there. Uh, and so, uh, they stole I, my work was stolen from me, and that this other company is making money off my data and things like that. Um, and there was a really I just want to make a joke here because there was a, a really good there was a really good article by Ian Bogost in the uh, the Atlantic um, about how he he we heard about this and he went oh yes some of my books are on there I discovered and I also discovered I don't care um, <laughs> and I had I had a fun interaction with him on Twitter where I was like you know. One of the funny things about and now now just to set the stage even further, there are lawsuits by some prominent yeah. individuals and groups of people saying, "Hey, because these the the LLM was trained on or the, was trained on my work, you owe me some you owe me some money." And I made this sort of point to him, which is that like you know a lot of people don't like obviously like what do I even understand about it? And I've spent a lot of time thinking and reading about it, but like the people who run them in a sense don't understand the LLMs either. Uh, but I said, you know, it very well could be. That it's actually the worst writers who are owed the most money because mm -hmm. by training on bad writing, uh, it knows what not to do, um, and it actually totally <laughs> follows uh, that 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 might that might in fact be the case. And so, what's your general? I mean, your personal view about like I know you 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 you've said on your podcast that you think there's going to be one big payout. Yeah, everybody's going to get a very tiny little bit, yeah. and that's going to be it forever. Um, do you think that? Like, let's say specifically people who are on that specific list of books that were sort of used to train the LLM. Do you think they are owed? They ought to be owed something? It's a really tricky question. And with a theology and philosophy degree, I feel like I could waste a lot of your time discussing an answer to it about what you mean by the word ought. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, but what I will say is the thing that's really interesting that's coming out of these lawsuits um, and how judges are taking the lawsuits um, is this sense that everyone has that something is wrong, but the inability anyone has to explain in law what that thing that's wrong is. Um, because the, the two most high profile cases so that have, have had court ruling initial rulings on them so far one one around art and one around books um have have said have basically gone and told people to reframe the case because they haven't demonstrated that copyright law has been broken um 
because whatever you might say about the moral rights and the fact that, yep, these authors weren't consulted, their consent wasn't given, um, and the work was used for something without their consent, and someone has made some money by doing something with it, um, but they haven't been able to prove that what that something that was done was infringing a right that is protected in law, which entitles them to compensation. And that that's really interesting. And it, in a way, it shows, I think this is why I say that there will be, I think there will be a moment where, where there is just a big payout to wash the slate clean before a new set of legislation is brought in, because it, it's made it clear that, that law as it stands doesn't know what to do. Um, I think the the things that judges have pointed out is that well the end works that they're not sufficiently close for it to be provable that this bit here there is a direct causal stream that leads from this input here to this output over here um, in such a way that hasn't changed it um, to the extent that you have to show that something hasn't changed to prove a copyright infringement. Um, it's a bit like the the music cases that have gone ahead where they where they do very specific analysis of the chord patterns and it literally gets down to what percentage of notes are are in the same order um and what kind of change has been undergone on the notes and if it reaches beyond a certain point then it's no longer copyright infringement um it's then artistic license um and I think that's the that's the struggle that people are having and I don't think that authors are going to come out on top of this and, and show that there is a copyright infringement. But I think that everyone knows that something feels wrong and something sits wrong and public opinion is sort of doesn't think well of it. And that's why I think we will, it's inevitable that a big, big tech company like OpenAI or Google or Meta can throw a few billion pounds at this and not notice. And I think that that's what will happen. And they will say, right, we're really sorry. It was a necessary thing to do. We're not admitting guilt, but as a, out of goodwill, we will we will give money to people who've been affected. Um, yeah, and that that's that's so. I think that's so well put when you talk about. But there, like complications, not aside, all complications all around us. Uh, but there's that 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 d it's very deep feeling that many people have that just yeah, something's wrong mm -hmm. with this, even if we can't put our finger on it, and. Just like an analogy I would use to sort of explain how difficult these things can be to pin down in law and not being a lawyer myself. But like you can imagine someone, let's we're talking about books. So let someone paid for a book display by the, the latest like autobiography or biography of a very big star. And they put this display in the front of a bookstore and everybody else in the bookstore, uh, well, and, and then, and then that drew in customers and then imagine the people who paid for that display and wrote that book were like, hey, all the other authors whose books are in this bookstore owe me money now because my paid for display brought all these other people in. We'd all react, well, that's ridiculous. You know, there's obviously that's, but but it's, although it's actually probably straightforwardly true, you would never say, yeah, but then everybody should be able to sue them for this just kind of like ordinary feature of of, of commerce. Yeah. And if you think about book covers, again, you th think of the, the, the sort of the stereotypes and memes of um, Earl Underwater on a blue cover, um, for example. If you Google that, you will find there are hundreds of books that have a girl underwater on a blue cover. Um, and it's a it suggests a certain kind of psychological thriller or coming of age type psychological thriller. Um, and there will have been a first instance of this. The person who did that first instance doesn't get everything else is in the style of them, but they they aren't directly compensated for every one of those subsequent covers. It's a and and this happens with culture a lot of the time. I mean, Richard Curtis rom coms, Nora Ephron rom coms, these things that, that set templates and creative templates. Tarantino films. It's at what point does does it become yeah, does, that does, we have does, this, the training become a infringement? Yeah, you just reminded me of like this. You know, this guy Ritchie on uh, oh Tarantino. You know, half yeah. of his half of his <laughs> income. Uh, yeah. 
just to, to pick on Guy Ritchie there. Uh, but um, yeah, no, I mean, and there's there's another sort of sort of very serious but kind of very hard to address version of this, which is like, well, remember there was a, someone who was trying to sue to get like a patent on all hyperlinks uh, years ago. This person claimed to have invented the hyperlink and wanted a <laughs> patent on it so that every time someone clicked on a link yeah. and every time anyone ever had clicked on a link, they were owed yeah. money. And what one, like, of course, then there's this sort of like, I, you know, I don't know how to define it, but I can know it when I see it. Hmm. No, we shouldn't do that. Um, and, and, you know, like a particular, I don't want to sound like a sort of like techno optimist, a naive techno optimist, but like, you know, it could be that like inhibiting some of these very powerful tools yeah. from being developed. Uh, they'll go ahead. Yeah. There we <laughs> go again. Me, here we go again. But inhibiting some of these very powerful tools from being developed might have been yeah. equivalent to not letting people link to things and just imagine how what a nightmare that would have been for a human I mean, development. The, the, the other thing which takes us on to something else that we had on our agenda is it's it's quite similar to the sort of the, the so-called link tax that I'm, you may have talked about a, a few years ago. The, the European Union wanted to um, if you if you were an aggregation site and they included Google and things like that as aggregation sites, if you if you had a snippet, you know the the preview bit you had, so you had the link at the top of the page and then you had the preview text. Um, and if someone clicked on that link, then you as Google would owe the the source of that link a you would owe them money because you had you were profiting. So your your adwords were profiting from the fact that they had let you use their content and it's so aggregation sites would have would have suddenly been liable to pay money on everything they included on even these tiny little yeah I'm, 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 I'm smiling because um uh just this year and just recently um the sort of uh news media organizations in canada won a victory along those lines against google and google just has to pay them a hundred million dollars a year now oh wow uh, and, it yeah it was million that's... dollars but it's yeah. it's that in reality, you know, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it, that's... The, the, well, the European Union didn't, I think, in the end, this wasn't put into law. It was written out of the law at the legislative stage because they, yeah. We can talk about well, political I mean, lobbying I, of tech companies. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I can, I can, I can, I just, you know, put my cards on my table. I, I think it's an outrage. I think it's, it's not just an outrage. It's not the money Google, Google doesn't care about a hundred million dollars. Um, uh, and there's like, and just, just bracketing all the problems of like, kind of who, who gets it, all the incumbent yeah. businesses that get it. Why should some like, I mean, now I'm going to kind of get in plaintive voice, but why should some, you know, private equity, uh, some Canadian newspaper owned by a private equity firm in, in the United States get a ton of free money so it doesn't have to pay its journalists anymore. Google is. You know what, yeah. what? What what does all of this actually even mean? Well, yeah, and it's probably all AI generated journalist content well, anyway these days. So. Well, yeah, there you go. Uh, and I mean, of course, you know. Well, I mean, maybe for another time. But you know, there's there's all as you said, you've got a degree in philosophy and theology and things like that. And you know, the idea of like what counts as um, uh, original thought in the first place is a, is a very deep question. And then the idea, like one of the one of the reasons that like I think. I mean, this is not this is a not an original observation, but one of the reasons I think a lot of people find automation in itself so troubling is that, and this is the old existentialist in me, is that they've spent their whole lives repressing how automated they are, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and it throws up in your face, you know, like yeah. how much of how much of my thoughts are scripted, how much of my patterns of speech are scripted, how many big decisions did I make in my yeah. life? That were essentially kind of automated, you know, yeah, uh, and this, you know, this, we love to believe in human exceptionalism. We love mm -hmm. to believe we are somehow different, and even even in its most secular form, we believe we are somehow there is nature, and nature goes all the way up to here, and all the way up to the great apes, and all the way up a little bit beyond them, and then suddenly there, something happens. Yeah, and uh, and to all of us. Um, <laughs> uh, that's that's the sort of ultimate chauvinism that you know this by being yeah. being one of those human beings. Yeah. I must I must be in possession of this kind of spark of freedom and independence, uh, and uh, we, we even without perhaps having to work on it or live a reflective life at all in the first place. But yeah. as I said, maybe if I'm next time I'm in Oxford, we can get together and talk about that. That would be fabulous. Uh, yeah. uh, but um, uh, 
anyway, just uh, so um, there's so much more we could talk about there, but I think we've we've sort of covered it, covered AI enough for now. Um, uh, and so the next uh, part of the uh, talk that I wanted to uh, move on to was um, regulation, um, which, you know, again, yeah. people listening who might not be familiar with the book publishing industry, there's tons of regulation going on in that world all the time. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. It's kind of weird. Uh, a lot of it doesn't really make a lot of sense, and some of it's very funny. Um, and uh, one of these sort of sort of funny things uh, that happened in the last year was uh, one of the so-called it's always big four, or big five uh, publishing book publishing companies in the United States, trade book publishing companies, I should say, Penguin Random House uh, tried to acquire another big uh, book publishing company, Simon and Schuster, and the department, the U.S. Department of Justice uh, Antitrust Division, quashed it in the end. Um, and you mentioned, you mentioned there was one of the, when I say funny, one of the funny things that came out of this whole spectacle, and I'll, I'll let you talk about it in, in a second, but one of the funny things for me that came out of this whole spectacle was this, these book publishing company CEOs on the hot seat, uh, who were like, yeah, we have no idea how we make money. Uh, it's a big gamble. That's why random, yeah. random is in the name of the company. Yeah, that was, and, and interestingly, just as I've just been reading while we were recording this about. Um, PRH, Penguin Random House, have just um, announced they're getting rid of 38 senior roles. Um, and and Mark Williams at the New Publishing Standard has a very a typically acerbic take that this is basically trying to pay off the $200 million that they spent trying and failing to acquire Simon & Schuster. Um, so a bit like Spotify, there are, the, there are these, these behemoth companies who are throwing money at things and it's not going their own way and they're suddenly realizing that throwing a lot of money at stuff doesn't work um but yeah that it was the really interesting thing about that was they were there was a level of materiality i think that they they had to show that there was a certain number of authors who would who would earn over a certain amount i can't remember what what was the amount that, that they had they had to show that there were at least so many authors who got six-figure advances. I think it might have been one hundred and fifty thousand dollar advances, um, but they didn't know how many they they were. Um, but they knew that that was a very healthy number, however many they were, and they were sure that whatever happened, although they didn't know what was going to happen, um, it wouldn't negatively affect the number of authors who were earning that amount. Um, and there were there were lots of authors putting their hands up and saying, "I think you." It's probably about three people who are earning that sort of money, and most of us are earning a couple of hundred bucks a book, if that. Because, um, like you say, they, they just didn't know how much they were paying their writers and how much how many books they were selling, or they they were at least acting to the judges as though they didn't know, according to what argument they were trying to prove, whether it was they, they were trying to prove that this would be terrible because it would mean that authors got paid less, or whether it would mean that it would be great if they integrated because authors would get paid more. Yeah, which which is um, uh, one of the reasons I think it would have resonated with with a certain constituency of person is that if you understand how these big publishing company companies present themselves and the the sort of affect and role that they play, it's as these guardians of hierarchy, guardians of the hierarchy of competence and and uh, expertise and big business and 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 like status basically, right? This is the whole the whole myth that the publishing company publishing world sort of built in the 20th century was you need us first of all there's such a thing as elevation in a hierarchy and two you need us to do it uh and to see people who present themselves as like kind of i mean in some sense is literally looking down from on high uh <laughs> you know uh suddenly just sort of going yep it's uh just a crap shoot and it's you know we don't really know what we're doing was very kind of bracing and funny and there's a lot of a lot of obviously Schadenfreude in it, but also a lot of like there's a very serious. It's actually a very serious point to make that like people who are in these positions of supposed eminence, uh, the emperor has no clothes, you know. Uh, and yep. that's not that's not that's not. I'm not saying that to be snarky or sarcastic or take anyone down. It's like this is the bracing reality that those of us who aren't don't benefit from that structure want to sort of point out to people who aren't aware of it and that it's all around them. And so to me, and in, in many ways, the sort of grand spec, the grand drama of it was actually political, which was, mm -hmm. you know, people trying, des people on, even on the DOJ side, trying to desperately say, oh, these big publishing houses are the, 
who publish and we can go into how many books they actually publish compared to how many books are out there, how many actually get bought and how many people read them. Uh, but there's this, this, this giant kind of pretending that, that this yeah. is like the, the high seriousness of the culture is at stake. Uh, and then yeah. it's like, maybe not. It's, it, it's very like Silicon Valley and the, the idea of the VCs throwing money and hoping something will stick. It's a very similar model. Um, and if you listen to someone like Peter Thiel talking and saying that literally you have your portfolio of 100 companies, you know 99 of them will go bust and one of them will make you, you haven't got a clue which one. And it, it feels like that. And it does it, it feels like you're going back to gambling. And it's, it's like those old things with Warren Buffett taking on hedge fund managers. There was a famous bet that he would always outperform a hedge, any hedge fund manager in the world over 10 years just by betting on the stock market. And it feels like, the publishing industry has been outed as what I guess a lot of people on the inside knew was, which is, it's like those hedge fund managers. Well, well, and that's, and that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at is that like, that's the, the fascinating thing is like the reality is very straightforward. If you know it, it's like, you know, when mm -hmm. people think of publishing, like they should think of J Jonah Jameson, you know what I mean? Like that's what you should think of. That's what it always was. Parker, get me the shots. You know, I don't care. I don't care if it's true or whatever, if it's, if it's misleading, whatever, like we're in this for the money. And like that's that, but that the pub because the publishing t companies, like the trade publishing companies, took this tack in the 20th century of being the guardians of hierarchical culture. Mm -hmm. They can't be like Peter Thiel and just say, no, no, it's just mm -hmm. a gamble. It's all about where we put the advertising money. We'll put 10 things mm -hmm. out there. We'll give them the same amount of advertising. With the one that takes off, the others get cut off, and we'll spend the rest of the budget yeah. on them. And even then, and, we don't. And that yeah, that, that kind of sort of shill mentality is a very good link into what we were talking about earlier with the the contrast or not the, the non-contrast um, with academic publishing. Um, and I was saying in the, the start that, that I've just reported on um, the fact that, that Cambridge University Press have announced profits of a billion pounds or billion dollars. No, billion pounds, $1.3 billion this year. Um, so that's basically more than half of what the whole of Simon & Schuster was going to be worth. Um, so the figures that we talk about with with trade publishing, when you compare them to academic publishing, they are minute um, because academic publishing is this this giant that, that sort of eclipses every other form of publishing that we think of as being huge. Um, and it does it on a, the back of a very similar totally Ponzi scheme, fraudulent type model that was set up by the likes of Robert Maxwell in the 19, sort of the, the, the mid 1900s, well, sort of the third quarter of the 20th century, when he set up all the, these journals at Reed Elsevier, right. came out of nowhere and they, they all had to be peer reviewed. And there's suddenly you got this sort of, this idea that peer review was the gold standard of research. And actually all that people meant by that was that that peer review is the thing that, that lines the Maxwell industry empire's pockets. Um, and so you, you have these academic publishers with these hundreds of thousands of journals that institutions pay a fortune of taxpayers' money for. Um, and th this comes back, I'm sure we must have talked about Aaron Schwartz and the whole open access movement last time I was on, mm -hmm. but it comes back to this idea that you've got publicly funded research that's then put behind a paywall in order to line the pockets of the academic publishing industry. Um, and it just, again, it feels like something is fundamentally broken about all these models. I agree. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the one place we can start is by trying to explain them. Uh, because yeah. again, you know, there's this facade that is very kind of carefully maintained. Uh, and this is not a conspiracy kind of observation at all. Like these these things are, you know, very straightforward business yeah. models and sort of yeah. forms of forms of marketing and, and positioning in people's minds and things like that. Uh, and, um, you know, so people think academic publishing, they think peer review, they think very serious research. And yet there's this like enormous, I don't know, vampire squid uh, on top yeah. of it all that uh, was, you know, rolled out very deliberately and that, that a lot of people benefit very directly from uh, yeah. and will fight tooth and nail to protect them. The, the, the relation between these journals looks very much like the diagrams that you see of Enron on the documentaries of there's this company over here and this company over here and this company over here and who knows where it ends. It's, it's, it's really a million model. Uh, again, the theme of the podcast will probably be there's so much to talk about just moving on uh, next. 
Um, so the EU recently passed its AI Act, yeah. uh, and this was a lots of people involved. Very big deal. I don't think a lot of details are out yet. Uh, yeah. But but if you could talk a little bit about what this might mean. Yeah. So this is probably for for next year. One of the things that's really interesting about this is it happened. The last discussion of it in the European Parliament happened just after the um, what I called on the the ally news column the the bad week for being called Sam. Um, so so it started it started with Sam Bankman Fried FTX going going belly up very publicly and um, SBF was jailed um, at the start of this very short period and then a few days after that um, Sam Altman was fired from OpenAI. Um, and then a few days after that, Sam Altman was back at OpenAI after Microsoft, had, from what I gather, Microsoft had agreed to hire everyone at OpenAI on more than they were being paid at the moment. Um, they said, okay, come back. And so Sam Altman came back and fired the whole of the board instead. So um, it, it came just at the end of that at a time when it felt like um, the tech industry had had sorted itself out to some extent, had shaken itself down and was going into full-on lobbying mode. Um, and this is what the big fight about the European Union's AI Act was about, was about to what extent is it going to be along the models of the the way that the UK government has positioned itself as being absolutely the friend of technology. Um, regulation is bad. Um, regulation is going to get in the way of innovation. Um, and to what extent is it going to be a much more traditional European model um, listening to the publishers? So there, there are a group of publishers who got together and say, you need to protect our authors. Um, and to, to what extent was it going to go down that route? Um, and one of the things they had done in the preliminary stages was to, to differentiate AI into different levels. So at the, at the top, there was what they called the, the existential threat level. Um, this was things like security identifying identifying people, facial recognition, social credit models. These were things that it was just going to outright ban. Um, at the bottom, there were, were things like Grammarly. Um, to use the, the sort of the, you know, Amazon has Ouch. changed its terms <laughs> and services so that mm -hmm. you, you can use AI tools, but you can't use AI generators. So, um, or you have to, you have to, you have to declare one, but not the other. Um, so at the bottom are these these, these tools that they're, they're very useful. They're, they're not really a danger to anyone. Um, but the second tier down was the sort of the, the high risk tier, as they called it, um, which were the large language models, um, things like DALI, um, Midjourney, um, things that that had the potential to cause all sorts of harms to jobs and disrupt business. Uh, if they weren't regulated and fully transparent. Um, so the the fear was that it, this was going to be changed so that instead of being regulated by law, the industry would be allowed to regulate themselves. Um, but it seems like th this hasn't happened. Instead, what's happened is that they have they have defined very large language models. So I think they they've the, the EU loves calling things very large. So it had this thing about very large online platforms, VLOPs, at, at the start of the year. Yeah. Um, and Amazon tried to argue it wasn't a very large online platform in one of the most hilarious pieces of casuistry you can see in order to, to try and avoid um, all sorts of transparency laws about advertising. Um, and so what they've done is they they have... They have defined large language models and high risk AI in such a way that virtually nothing comes under the heading. So it's still there and it still has to be regulated and isn't allowed to regulate itself, but virtually nothing counts as it because it's so big. There's a there's a certain amount of petaflops that your system has to use before it's counted as a um as an AI large language model. And I think I think it's 10 to the 25 flops. Um, okay. Whatever that works out in terms of petaflops. Um, yeah. And that's probably getting, that's getting beyond my technical knowledge, but it's, it's big. It's the sort of thing that probably has an energy bill the size of a medium sized country. That's uh that's really fascinating. And an example of the kind of things where like, you know, the headlines might not quite capture 
uh, what's what's yeah. really going to happen, and we'll we'll find out as the year unfolds. Um, yeah. Uh, and like the last, well, there's the the second last thing I wanted to maybe very briefly ask you about, uh, and under the heading of regulation, is um, the UK online safety bill. Uh, which actually yeah. is kind of quite important for authors uh, in a lot of ways and publishers and things like that. Um, so this came out of, um, there was a very um, series of tragic deaths um, that were linked to social media and in particular were linked to um, sites on social media that promoted things that I can't talk about on this if it's going on YouTube because it will demonetize you. Um <laughs> And I've forgotten what the the short the the acronyms are um, that you are allowed to use, um, but they're related to food, um, and they are related to yeah things that you do to yourself. Um, so anyway, the, the the parents of the children who were um, who took their lives started a campaign to get social media regulated so that that kind of content couldn't be accessed by um, by minors. Um, and this has led, uh, after many years of debate, uh, to the online safety, um, online safety slash online harms act. And what that does is it makes sites responsible for the content. The long story short, it makes sites responsible for the content that is on them, and for ensuring that minors don't view that content. Um, and the really key thing is. This includes content that might not be illegal, but is deemed to be harmful. Um, and harmful in that sense is very much like the old fashioned view of obscenity in that it's not actually defined, but the judge knows it when they see it, um, which is, this obviously goes back and publishing has a long history of problems with this, with the Oz trials in the 1960s and so on. Um, the problem with that for us as authors is that we we put excerpts of our work on the web. Um, we host other authors who do such things. We we participate in blog tours. Um, our footprints are everywhere. And for those people who write in genres, or especially nonfiction writers who write about issues that may be deemed harmful, um, so these might be self-help books that are really beneficial, but nonetheless, the subject matter might be deemed harmful. Um, there is going to be a big onus on them to ensure that uh, minors aren't exposed to their work. And that's going to be, it's going to potentially lead to, to fines. And it's also going to be just expensive and time consuming to go through that level of due diligence to make sure your website is, is, is clean in that way, as well as stopping you writing about what you write about. And I mean, you, you do only have to look at them. I say slightly jokingly, I can't talk about it because of demonetizing you, but but this is something that YouTube creators have to think about all the time. Um, because there are things they cannot say. Yeah, that um, uh, and on the concept of things that cannot say, and it's actually kind of related, but it might be an odd segue from the you know UK <laughs> Online Safety or Harms Act to, you know, book bans in the United States, which were a huge issue this this year. Um, and it's like this matter of deeming harmful uh, really sort of comes to the fore there. You know, where's the authority to say what deemed yeah. what's deemed harmful? What kind of arbitra what kind of as time passes, what kind of temporal arbitrariness are we subject mm. to as as power shifts from one from the hands of one group to another? Uh, yeah. things like that, you know, like all of a sudden what's harmful isn't and what, what is, is what isn't is, um, yeah. you know, and how do you navigate that as a librarian? How do you navigate that as a teacher? How do you navigate that as an, as an author? And how do you navigate that as a publisher? Um, yeah. and, uh, it's just, it's just the sort of like moment we're going through. There have been moments before, uh, that were fraught, you know, uh, and, um, you know, this is, this is definitely one, um, and. I was just yeah, was wondering what are your general thoughts and observations on this, which I don't, I don't think we really need to go into much detail of explaining because yeah, I don't want I don't want to start a massive controversy. It's yeah. I would say it's really interesting. I read an article I think it was in TechCrunch this week, a survey of the most likely the most likely jobs to be automated, 
um, and librarian came at top of, uh, of one of the surveys. I saw a job's most likely to be automated, which I found really interesting um, <laughs> because that, yeah, it would, it would, the librarians have a hard job and that would, I guess, someone would feed into an algorithm somewhere what was deemed harmful and it would just, that would curate it. Um, but my, I mean, it comes back to as well to the argument that we saw a lot of it early on in the pandemic and just before the pandemic between publishers and librarians. And there have been a, there has been a trend to, uh, for people in, in or adjacent to the book world to pick fights with librarians. Um, so the publishing world did this with, and is still doing it with this sort of like metered usage thing. Yeah. Um, and how you charge e for ebooks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my take then, which is probably the same as my take now is I, I'm not sure how anyone who fought with librarians ended up on the right side of history because li librarians are our sort of, they are our saints, um, the angels who walk among us. And I don't think I'd ever want to be on the side that wasn't the side of the librarians and this kind of thing or any kind of thing. Yeah, guardians of uh, of knowledge, uh, and um, when it comes to I mean, when it comes to the automation, I mean, the local community librarian isn't just uh, fulfilling so much for books, more. you know, yeah. like that. That that sounds like those those guys that I like TechCrunch fine, but they, they might not <laughs> know they might have the wrong idea of what a librarian yeah. is. Uh, it's not just someone referencing re you know things, um, right? Uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, I guess you know that's that's one one thing that you brought out there just to sort of maybe close off the sort of conversation about book bans and stuff like that. But it is interesting the sort of one of the things you said there, you know, if one can replace certain decisions with automation, it absolves the people in command of that organization from certain kinds of responsibility, right? And so this is going back to like one of the big things about AI. Like there was wasn't there something that like there was some postal service outrageous thing in the uk where people were like going to prison for crimes they hadn't committed or being fired yeah, yeah. because some executives yeah. were just believe or even managers were just believing what the ai, AI told them but yeah. how, like, so we, there was basically it, this was fairly basic software that ba that, yeah. that had a had a bug in it that made it look as though local post office workers were um not declaring all their cash register earnings and so a bunch of post office post office workers got jailed um, for fraud and for, for theft um, as a result of this glitchy software. Um, and even now they they have been freed, but there is still an argument about whether they whether or not they should be pardoned, even though everyone knows that they, they didn't take anything. It was just this software got the stats wrong. But everyone things, believed it. Some things make me feel profoundly alienated from the world, and it's that yeah. that kind of thing when you hear about it, or like if someone who's known to be innocent who is kept on death row for decades. Uh, you know, things along those lines uh, makes you makes you wonder about uh, you know, yeah, our lives. Um, uh, just moving on from there to um, so we've we've covered uh, technology, we've covered regulation uh, in twenty twenty three, a bunch of things already. And just for the last part of the interview, I thought we'd sort of move on to what might be the most natural thing for us to talk about, which is indie publishing in 2023 and uh, some of the trends and, and things that we learned. And I was wondering, we, we talked a little bit about, about, bit about Spotify, but just generally about audiobooks as, you know, is this something that's like much more of a kind of interest, maybe because, you know, it's easier to, to generate it now from your, from your book if you've done it. Is this a big deal for basically self-published authors or indie authors in 2023? Um. It is, yes. So the year sort of started with, with audible gates still rumbling. So there was there was all this fuss about about re refunds through Audible and Amazon's really untransparent way of calculating refunds. Um and realizing that people could listen to the whole ebook and then claim a refund. Um and they they, they could do it within they had a, a massive window of time in which they could do it and then the the things would just be disappearing out of people's earnings and they'd end up with negative earnings for months and they didn't know why. Um, so that that's how the year started, but it's, that didn't help with, with, with Audible um, and ACX. And then we've seen it's become easier. Findaway Voices has had quite a good year. So the, the other big indie 
platform for audiobooks, um, they they are making things available through Spotify. Um, so you can get your book as an indie author out onto Spotify through them, um, as well as pretty much everywhere else. Um, and most places are now looking at AI generated narration. So Google Play Books is letting you uh, use AI audio generation for free. Um, Amazon has just got in on the act. So so KDP now will let you turn your eBooks. Well, it, I think it's still in beta, but they they have a system to let you turn your eBooks into audio audio books um, for free. Um, so it is becoming a big deal. Um, audiobooks were already a big deal for people who could afford them. Um, they they are expelling. This is this traditionally the problem. If you don't want to do it yourself and don't have the technology or the the skills to do it yourself, then finding a voice narrator um, who will do a great job is expensive. It's yeah. thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, AI generated narration then came along, which was hundreds of dollars, and now you can do it for free. Um, and so that is for people who are going to have their books listened to and whose books are going to do well as audiobooks, that, that is opening up all sorts of possibilities. But it, it is stretching it's stretching the pot, like we said, because audio is, it keeps growing. The amount of audio people listen to keeps growing, but it's not growing that fast. And um, you can only listen to it so much quicker than the spoken, the human voice speaks. Uh, you can't, you can't necessarily speed read it. So we might differ in our speed reading speed by a factor of 10. And if we, if we skim, for example, we certainly could differ by a factor of 10. You can't really do that with audio books. Um, I know Jane Friedman, um, had a great piece about how she just discovered listening to things at twice speed. I think it was. Yeah. Two X. Um, yeah. The old two X. Yeah. 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 But you can't really go much quicker than that without losing it. Yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, it's a fascinating format. I mean, it's it's interesting. It might be become as just a, as rote to have an audio version of something as it is to have a cover a cover image for for a book. Do you know what I mean? Like, it yeah. might just be like whether people spend any time with it or not. It might just be something that that you expect to be there, and is just an inherent component of it. Uh, but you know, I think um, particularly there's a certain kind of uh, there's a certain type of reading that you do that might involve annotation and you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, audiobooks. you can pause and things like that. And who knows, there, there probably there's an app for annotating audiobooks out there. If there isn't, you owe me money, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if you go ahead and do it, but, um, uh, yeah, I know there's certain, there's certain types of reading that are ways of interacting with text that just aren't, aren't compatible with that. But as you say, you know, like that we, now we sort of start brushing up against the kind of edge of just like attention, yeah. uh, full stop. How much time do we have in the day that we're devoting to things like this? You know, what was the, the old Netflix thing? Like our biggest competition is like sleep and food. Uh, well, not food actually, uh, cause you can eat when you're watching it, but, uh, <laughs> and it might make you hungry. Uh, but, but in any case, yeah. Uh, so I think, I think they found that, that, that it is about 1.5 books a month that people listen to. Um, right. and this is, this is just a sweet spot that I think that's why streaming is, People are happy to offer streaming because they know they're not. Authors are not that worried about income dilution or have been not that worried about income dilution because they think that no one's ever going to actually read more than 1.5 books on audio. Um, right, right, right. Makes sense. That, yeah, I'm not sure how how that will work out, but uh, and yeah, there's no, all we'll... sorts of potential. I think yeah. Daniel Eck said that he he could spot a listen farm i think i don't know if you remember that it was so the ceo of spotify and a listen farm yeah basically people tried that just like they used to do it with with uh kindle unlimited you yeah. know, like the sort of reading farms and stuff like that a listen yeah. farm would be something that's trying to however it's set up whatever whether it's, it's a lot of people or a lot of robots you know you know it's it's playing it's clicking to get yeah. plays and sort of you know yeah he, he reckons he can spot but that that behavior i'm not sure that also, it feels like it's there is a, probably a lot of gaming we've seen this this year again. We've seen lots of stories about people trying to scam Amazon in the, this ways. This is 
there will always be people who try and scam these systems and there will always be ways to do it in that. Uh, yeah. Another, another, uh, I would say, uh, v- very, very major, uh, perhaps unovercomable flaw with the subscription model from the content creators' perspective. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, the second last thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, was uh, something you mentioned before: the uh, bright spot in the world of self-publishing, which is graphic novels. Um, and so, I was wondering yeah, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that. Yeah, I just wanted to, to to highlight the fact that graphic novels are still doing really well. Um, and just this week, it's been in the in the news um, in the UK. Um, people who know Heartstopper, um, which I am trying to think what channel it's on as a massively best-selling TV series now on streaming TV. Um, started life as a graphic novel. So the fifth book in the Heartstopper series um, has just become um, the third, I think it's, oh no, fastest selling graphic novel ever in the UK. Um, and Alice Oseman, who is the uh, the author, has become the third highest selling author of graphic novels ever in, in the UK, um, behind the likes of Alan Moore, who is obviously a watchman and the like fame. Um, and this is something that started as a self-published series. It started on Tumblr, um, of all, oh, wow. the, all places. Yeah, and, and and again through this is something that is part of the Nava um, conglomerate, um, like Wattpad. So Web- Webtoon is is the the place that it went after it was on Tumblr, um, which is self-publishing platform for um, for graphic novels in this sort of this webtoon format where you've got panels one over the other in sort of say you read down um, rather than down and across um and it's it's really overlooked I mean, it's it's massive and again like like Wattpad and places like archive of our own and all these sort of fan fiction sites they have massive followings and you get real breakout performances happening um this is this is a series that's now sold over a million copies. Um, it was only mainstream published in 2019, um, having come from being a massive success on um, on webtoon. Um, so yeah, graphic novels continue to to sort of buck any downward trends in. Yeah, that's that's just fantastic. It's always good to hear in an industry where it could be so hard to to sort of make money uh, and yeah. make a living. Uh, it's always great to hear that. And on that note. I just uh, segued into the last thing I wanted to talk about. We saved it for the end. I kind of actually wanted, I initially <laughs> wanted to talk about it at the beginning. Uh, but one one really great thing that came out in the in the sort of, you know, indie publishing world this year was the Alliance of Independent Authors Indie Author Income Survey. Uh, it might sound like an income survey is kind of like, why would that be so interesting or exciting? <laughs> but it actually was for a number of reasons. I could say personally for me, um, my joke is that the only like kind of, mainstream industry analysis journalism that's worse than auto industry journalism is book publishing industry journalism uh it's just like kind of you read it and if you know anything about the industry you're like like the late i'm going to pick on the new york times like yeah ac everything they write about book publishing is just like outrageously wrong uh yeah. and and ignorant to use a stronger word than naive uh but that, it, but but to do it deliberately they're ignorant um, and, uh, and then there was always the, an institution I won't name that whose name presents itself as defending authors in the United States that comes up with just outrageous nonsense about authors and what, and, you know, and this is, there's something we just to segue into the, letting you talk. Uh, there was this Jane Friedman actually to come bring up her again. She wrote this very great post, uh, about the Alliance for Independent Authors in the, uh, Authors Income Survey. She didn't quite say it straightforwardly and maybe she <laughs> didn't even mean to say this, but by saying, by basically bullshitting about how little authors were supposedly making, uh, like conventionally published authors, they actually made self-publishing authors look way better, uh, <laughs> which, yeah. is just kind of, which is just kind of funny. <laughs> but anyway, so um, the Alliance of Independent Authors came up with this great survey. It showed that um, you know self-published authors kind of on average, kind of make between twelve and thirteen thousand dollars a year, American, yeah. uh, which is like double what what the these other organizations sort of has been saying. Author full time authors make. So anyway, with all that set, 
and my little uh, hobby horse off my chest, uh, if you could uh, maybe talk about this really wonderful survey. And, yeah, and so it's, 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 like you say, there are as many articles written about why traditional surveys of these things are rubbish as there are surveys of things. Um, and the, the the real thing that they, they never look at is that they... You never get a whole picture because they they only look at books that have got ISBN, so that's the first thing. Um, other things only sample from certain bookstores, sort of like like the old days of of the singles charts, where you would you would have a set of billboard stores that you would go to, and you would you would imagine what the picture was from what the, those stores reported to you. Um, so there are all sorts of ways that traditionally it's done. Um, what the Ally survey did was actually asked authors um, what they earned. Which seems like revolutionary, <laughs> um, but I mean, th this is part of the problem with traditional authors because a lot of traditional authors, I think, probably genuinely don't know what they earn, which is an indictment on the publishing industry who send out royalty statements years too late, referring to periods that are often years ago, um, and send them out in this really complex language with all sorts of deductions. And by the time they reach the author, it's you've had the agent deduction and every other deduction made as well. Um, so the author genuinely doesn't know what they actually earned in the last three months. And they certainly don't have sight of the figures of how many books they sold in the last three months. Whereas as indie authors, we we know all that because it's there on our dashboards. Um, so we can, we can get those figures. So it is, we are a more reliable source of information than a lot of other things. Um, so we, there were, I think there were something like 5,000 result or returns to the survey so it was it was a really useful set of information and it used the same the same criterion as uh the other survey that it's compared to by an organization i won't name if you weren't if you weren't naming them <laughs> which is that someone should spend 50 percent of their work time on writing and writing related activities um so a couple of really interesting things to take away that I'll start with the, the negative, which is quite an interesting one, which is the, that indie authors make, we, we, we do make more money, it seems, um, as a median than our traditionally published counterparts. Um, but we make most of our money through the books that we sell. So writing and writing related activities are were both counted in the survey um, and they're counted as two different things so we we make less money from writing related activity than other authors do and i don't know whether that's because more of us have day jobs that means that we can't or because there is a mindset thing that so that, that we we think that we should be making all our money through just writing the books or whether it's simply the business of publishing because we are spending all our time on that business mm -hmm. means that we do the business really well, but we don't have time for the other things that, that writers do because they're not taking care of that business side of things. So it's, it'll be really interesting. It's going to be a longitudinal right. study to see right. if we can unpack that. Um, cause I, I mean, my sense is that the, the business of publishing and I, and I know that people like Joanna Penn, who are really good at this, talk a lot about making sure you slice and dice your rights, for example, so that you maximize your territorial rights um, and you maximize your audio rights. And and that takes a huge amount of time. Eventually you build templates, but, but until you build templates, this this does take time. And it it kind of reminds me of, um, I don't know if you know Freakonomics, the book. I haven't read it, but I know of it, yeah. Many years ago, there's a, there's a thing about a chapter about why estate agents aren't set up to do the best for their clients because they work on a commission basis. So if you work on a 10% commission basis or a 5% commission basis, it's in your interest just to sell houses. Getting getting an extra $10,000 for your client on a $200,000 house isn't going to make you much more money. You're far better off just selling it for $200,000 and moving on to the next house. So you as an agent aren't going to get much money by spending the time doing that and i i wonder if as indies we are spending so much try time trying to optimize our markets that we're actually just not writing the next book um and i think that there might be something to be learned from from that and 
it fits with what we're seeing with with more more of the platforms like Publish Drive have started doing it, Street Live have started doing it, Draft the Digital have started doing it, of offering real genuine one stop shops to take care of everything and every part of the business for us. So we're it will be easier for us to do that and just hand it put it in here and it comes out there in the configuration we want in all the territories we want with all the all the rice nicely diced up in the formats. Yeah, that's that's so interesting that you say that the one stop shop thing that actually we've been we've been having this pulled out of us by our authors as well, uh, very explicitly. Yeah. Um so uh yeah. So on that note, uh thank you very much, Dan, for taking the time thank out you. of out of out of a, a beautiful, I'm sure, Friday evening in the you know sort <laughs> of the Oxford area. Uh I hope it was anyway. From from your podcast, I know you've had storms and things like that. It's uh, been pretty chaotic here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh but and thank you very much for taking the time to cover so much ground and thank being you. game for it. I'm sure we could have talked more. Uh but yeah, and I was really looking forward to this and the conversation was as good as I was hoping for. So thanks very much, Dan. Thank you very much indeed.